Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure we are inspired and challenged and wish that we had an opportunity to ask questions. Unfortunately, due to the structure of our workshop or our conference, it is not possible, but at the moment, I would like to share with you an opportunity to follow up conversations. Uh, Jean-Claude has been very gracious to agree to connect with anyone interested online on the community of practice. If you could kindly send your questions, concerns on this email or to this email address, hm hlm3 at worldbank.org, and we will be able to organize a forum online to discuss further any questions, any interests you may have coming from his keynote speech. Once again, thank you very much for your remarks. We will now, thank you. <laughs> we will now move to our first plenary session, if you are following in your program agenda which is themed the strategic importance of knowledge sharing for development. And our panel will be seeking to answer the question, why does it matter? It is my pleasure to invite up our panelists and, and kindly honor, honorable guests, if you hear your name, would you kindly join me up on the stage? First up is the Honorable Minister, Suleiman Husseini Adamu, who is the Minister for the Federal Ministry of Water Resources from Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome up the Honorable Minister. My pleasure to welcome up His Excellency the Honorable Governor, Peter Munya, who is the Governor for Meru County, and currently the chair of the Council of Governors. Welcome, Governor. Welcome. Up next is our Honorable Madam Minister Elvira Sarieva, who is the Minister of Education and Science, the Kyrgy Kyrgyz Republic. Please welcome her up. And our Honorable Minister, Serejine Bayetiam, who is the Minister of Education from the Republic of Senegal. Cool. And to moderate this session for us is Annette Dixon. If you could kindly join us at the front. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, my pleasure to moderate this uh, first plenary discussion this morning. And I think, uh, it, it, we, I think we've all uh, been inspired and have very much enjoyed uh, hearing from Jean-Claude about uh, knowledge management in the context of the private sector. And I think it's been inspiring to hear how uh, Microsoft has been able to drive innovation, uh, productivity, excellence, uh, through knowledge management, and I think uh, there is lots of lessons there that we can apply to the public sector context. I think, uh, you know, clearly the, the takeaway for me, I will never forget the quote, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, that will stay with me, uh, I think, for a long time. But I think that the centrality of changing behavior uh, and driving uh, uh, business objectives through behavior change and the way in which knowledge management has been leveraged uh, to play this role. So the distinguished speakers today are really going to help us transition into the public sector context. In that context, we want to explore how governments, uh, uh, what governments can do to provide an environment for knowledge sharing and to make it happen more systematically. And what are the biggest impediments for knowledge sharing uh, in the public sector context. 
In this session, we want to set the stage uh, for the rest of this third high-level meeting on country-led knowledge sharing. So hence, we're going to hear from uh, esteemed country representatives. We want to tease out how knowledge sharing can be used as a strategic catalyst for, for development and for sustained development. We want to hear about the solutions that countries can provide to get uh, political support uh, for knowledge sharing, to, make it, to help make it happen more systematically, how knowledge makers, uh, what knowledge makers can do to approach uh, knowledge sharing as a critical part of development, um, and lastly, to hear about how partners can actually help to make this happen. I think, I think for all of us, the transition from the private sector to the public sector is how we can use knowledge sharing to drive good public policy and improved services for citizens. With that, I'd very much like to move into introduction, introductions of the speakers. I think we're going to start with the Honorable Suleiman Husseini Adamu, who, as we heard, is the Federal Minister of Water Resources in Nigeria. He is an engineer by training. He uh, was, prior to taking up his appointment in government, he was the managing director and chief executive of Integrated Engineering Associates, which is a consulting engineering firm. He holds a bachelor in engineering uh, from, in civil engineering from Amadou Bello University in Nigeria, and he has a master's of science uh, in construction and project management from the University of Reading in the United Kingdom. He has served on the Council for the Regulation of Engineering, uh, in Nigeria and is, a sitting, is the sitting president of the Association of Consulting Engineering in Nigeria and he is a fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineers and, an, uh, and a member of the American Society of Engineers. Thank you very much. Welcome. I invite you to speak for five minutes and then I'll introduce uh, you, the next panelist. Thank you. Okay. Um, Your Excellencies, uh, Madam Moderator, good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. For me, I think uh, having come from the private sector into the government uh, in the last four months was uh, an eye opener because uh, I came from a different culture. Uh, I came and found a situation where uh, Personnel were operating in silos. Everybody was working for himself. No horizontal and vertical movement. The issue of uh, who needs to know and who has the right to know was not there. Uh, people just uh, did their own thing. Um, basically, also, uh, I, I realized that uh, uh, a lot of things are happening, but. Uh, there is no record, there is no, no institutional memory. Uh, in the last two months, I've seen three or four directors re uh, retiring, uh, and I've been worried about uh, what next, because they seem to have uh, everything in their grasp, but uh, I have not been able to see the people below that level to know whether they will be able to carry the, 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 the mantle. Um, we also, we also have a very, Nigeria, we have a very large population. It's a very huge country, 170 million people. We are a federal system, 36 states, plus the federal capital territory, and 774 local authorities. And uh, trying to manage the information flow uh, among this, uh, that's huge structure, is very, very difficult. Um, one thing I realized that must be done uh, is to to really formalize knowledge management and knowledge sharing. That is not there. Uh, I think it's important that there is a de deliberate effort and people in government are conscious of the fact that they need to share information, which they don't do at the moment. Uh, besides that, uh, I think we need to invest heavily in technology. Uh, I have noticed a lot of uh, people are still using emails, Yahoo, Gmail, Hotmail. We have a, a hub for government, but e-governance is not being used. And I think that is a very important platform for sharing information. Uh, we need to invest more in that. Uh, also, coming to uh, maybe uh, the interventions by development partners, I think we need to start looking at, uh, uh, under the capacity building component of our programs, 
it is important that we include this concept of knowledge management and knowledge sharing. I know you invest in uh, information technology equipment to help things go around, but basically to communicate between the, uh, the World Bank, for instance, and the project uh, implementation units, I think it will be very, very important that we have a component of knowledge management and knowledge sharing uh, on projects so that we can also continue to know what is going on uh, in other parts of the world, we can begin to understand global best practices. I happened to be in uh, Addis Ababa two weeks ago at the Sanitation and Water for All conference, and uh, one of the things I came out with was that in Ethiopia, the advocacy works. They have uh, about 80 million people, uh, and they seem to be getting along with programs on open defecation and so on, and it's not happening in my, it's not happening in my country. And I wanted to know why. And uh, uh, there's, I've not seen any platform, really. Uh, let me not indict anybody. But I don't think the information has gone enough for us and other parts of the world to know that this is the success story in Ethiopia. Unless maybe you attend conferences, you probably don't, don't know. So as a matter of routine, we need to have this kind of information sh being shared uh, among, among, among partners among uh, uh, beneficiaries of development uh, 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 programs and projects. I think this is what I can say in five minutes, maybe more later. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is uh, His Excellency Governor Peter Munya, who is the governor of Meru County and the current chairman of the Council of Governors in Kenya. He's also former Assistant Minister of the Ministry of East African Community. He served uh, as the second Member of Parliament for Tigania East constituency, uh, Meru County in central Kenya. Um, Governor Munya uh, graduated with a Bachelor of Law degree from the University of Nairobi, and he also has a Master's degree in International Law and International Economic Integration Law from the University of Brussels. Uh, and he also has a second master's degree in law uh, from the University of Georgia in the US where he majored in public international law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kenya and um, a new constitution that came in place in 2010, we operate now under two levels of government, at the national level and the county level. And the Council of Governors is the premier institution that brings together the devolved level of government. It is an institution created by law, and uh, it brings that level of government together for them to be able to do collaborative work uh, between themselves. One, be able to consult on matters of mutual interest. Do two, also share information on their functions with a view of picking best, best practices that are being done by the various county governments and also be able to correct where mistakes are being made and be able also to innovate from what has already been done from, by other county governments. It also serves as a forum for resolving disputes between uh, county governments where disputes may have arisen it also serves as a forum for capacity building, for governors and even for workers, county staff, for them to be assistant to on, on capacity building. It also helps in terms of uh, carrying out the joint programs and joint programs uh, that are being promoted at the national level, and also programs that uh, development partners may also be bringing on board to help county governments. So it's a premier institution that brings county government together and um, therefore is a major institution for information sharing, uh, uh, knowledge sharing uh, between uh, the county governments. Uh, what have we learned, learned for the period we've been there in terms of uh, the strategic value of uh, knowledge sharing? Um, one, we've been able to know that you'll be able to save resources if you share knowledge, because you are, you are able to avoid duplicating 
or you know uh, experimenting on what is already known don't go you know experimenting on something that already another county has undertaken successfully therefore you are able to sh to save resources that would have been spent on trying to reinvent a wheel on a matter that has already been uh, uh, sorted out by a county before you you are also able to correct mistakes by learning from counties that have already done mistakes when implementing programs you are able to avoid those mistakes by picking learning from a county that has already been able to do it make mistakes and successfully uh, do something before you so that you avoid that path of uh, uh, making mistakes thirdly you are also able to innovate because you build from what your others have already done you improve on what is already being done by by a county uh, we are also able to innovate in terms of for example uh, counties that are picked um, projects that are um, innovative in terms of not being very expensive like road building people have picked technologies from elsewhere and they practice them you are able to borrow from them and therefore save on resources that you could have spent grouping in the dark looking for solutions when they are they are already there so um, you are also able to improve on service delivery uh, in various sectors, like Herald, for example, we've seen counties um, that have uh, expanded provision of health and improved quality of service delivery by learning from counties that have innovated uh, uh, in advance, that have innovated uh, and gone ahead and did certain practices that are not in those other counties. Therefore, knowledge sharing is, is, is critical. and. Uh, the problem we have also experienced, if I were also to uh, talk about the challenges, is that uh, governments generally are very protective of, 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 of their information. Uh, they operate almost with a closed door approach so that uh, it's very difficult accessing information from one government to another, even at the county level. So that uh, it require, requires a lot of um, uh, working together, a lot of uh, meetings, a lot of uh, sharing for you to be able to build that solidarity, uh, to be able to accept, to, to share information and um, to work together. The tendency is for government to protect their tasks and uh, keep out anybody who is not part of that government. And therefore working together in a collaborative manner helps to break those barriers and therefore creates op opportunities for, for government to work together collaboratively and therefore benefit from knowledge sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next we'll hear from Her Excellency Elvira Sarieva, uh, who's the Minister of Education and Science in the Kyrgyz Republic. Prior to, to this uh, position, she was the Vice Prime Minister for the Kyrgyz Republic, covering the social affairs portfolio, which includes health, social protection, and education. She led the uh, public organization, previously she led the public organization, Internews, and was for many years its executive director. She's also served as a coordinator for the Caucasus, Afghanistan, and Central Asia in the CLA uh, Leadership Academy for Young Professionals. She has extensive experience uh, with public activities, having been the chairperson of the Kyrgyz Public Television and Radio broadcast Broadcasting Company and was a member of the Bishkek City Council. She holds degrees with honors from the Bishkek uh, Humanitarian University, and she graduated from the Kyrgyz State Academy of Law and the Kyrgyz Academy of Management. Welcome. Thank you so much. Your Excellencies, dear participants, I want to have um, a very quick uh, note on why uh, sharing information and experiences is very important, especially for countries like ours. 
When I became a Minister of Education, I digged into the archives to understand the essence and the history of education development in Kyrgyz Republic, and um, one statistical figure was shocking, is that uh, preschool age kids, uh, there was only 18% of those kids who had access to preschool education. And um, one year and a half ago, when I became a Minister, we had the same statistics, 18% of kids uh, compared to 1931, when we had also 18%, was the same number was uh, back uh, one year and a half ago. And uh, the change uh, we had in my country when we were a part of the Soviet Union, and right now when we are an independent state, uh, and the stages we pass uh, definitely depend on the information and experience sharing that we had then and now. Because, well, I was lucky, I went to a kindergarten, probably that is why I became a Minister of Education. But uh, uh, then, uh, right now, uh, and then, uh, during the Soviet Union in 1931, when we had this 18%, we had only one recipe. One only recipe for 15 countries, members of the Soviet Union, and there was nothing else. Right now, it's like a supermarket. There's so much information, experiences, and uh, faults and successes of other countries and ministries and in the education sphere, and it's right there. It's in the cloud, and uh, there is enough information, I think. It's just, if you're looking for something, you'll always find it. And countries like ours, we trace the latest tendencies, and since everything is growing and developing so fast, uh, while with the same human material that we all have, but with different resources, very limited in our case, we have to a, jump from one stage to the other stage, omitting and skipping some of them, uh, unlike other very developed countries. Uh, but uh, we have to do that because there is a challenge and there is a global challenge and uh, we have to keep up with the global goals, right? They are all the same for all the countries. And we all want that our kid from my country or from another country is very competent and uh, becomes the, the right person for the world. So what I wanted to um, uh, stress is that uh, in, in such a situation, I think the development institutions like the World Bank, for instance, they, they come in the right place and they have all the rights and they, they are there to help us uh, to match the demand. We have, with the supply of practical knowledge that uh, is there in the supermarket. Uh, what I mean is that, uh, for instance, in our case with preschool education, with 18% and limited resources and the huge number of kids that we have to give education, uh, we, we had several uh, different solutions on the table. And the suggestions of our international partners, the one that they gave us and which was like committing a suicide for me as a minister because all the parents, they are working, they want full-time care for their kids from 9 to 6 p.m. And the suggestion that was provided to, to limit it to three hours, uh, that basically meant that I had to tell the kid that he, he or she has to go home after lunch or with no lunch. Uh, however, this lead, uh, this very example, uh, the practical knowledge that we had uh, as an advice uh, from our international partner helped us to increase the number by 30% right now, within one year and a half. Uh, and that decision was based on the practical knowledge and experiences of other countries that we saw. And I think these types of uh, advices are very, advice is, is uh, very important and helpful because A, when there's a political will in the country, which is a must, B, when out of the huge information resources and cases, you choose the one which is suggested and recommended based on practical experiences of other countries, this is when you achieve success and you provide more access to education at least and, and then raise uh, the quality of education. So why does it matter to share information? In the era when um, basically the hardware uh, empowerment is, um, is not important anymore, when everything is in the cloud, when it's important, uh, when the software is important, and when the knowledge and information, there's so much of it, I think um, it's not an issue for countries uh, uh, to have the borders and to divide us between the countries because things, be Although I'm, I'm very uh, keen to protect our national interest and just like anyone in this room, 
I think it's very important to understand that uh, the information is changing the world in such a quick way that we in the education field, in a very conservative field, uh, have to somehow keep up with that and to find solutions so that uh, understanding that every kid in each country is smart and talented and cute and at the same time, we have to make sure that all together, while sharing our information and experience in best cases, we are making sure that each kid in this world is very competent and becomes a hero in this world. And this is where, this is where on um, panels like this and in everyday work, each of us should not only share information, but also share the... Um, uh, the bad sides and the good sides of whatever we do. And this is the most uh, helpful and practical from my experience as a Minister of Education and Science. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, um, and now we're going to hear from His Excellency Serene uh, Mbai Tiam, who is uh, Minister of Education for Senegal. Before becoming Minister of Education, he served as a Member of Parliament uh, and Vice President of the Commission of Economy and Finance and General Rapporteur of the Budget in the National Assembly. He was also Minister of Higher Education and Research uh, and Spokesperson for the Government. Prior to these elected uh, political and government functions, he was Director in the Administration and Finances of the autonomous port of Dakar and an international consultant on management, organization, finance, and accounting. He chaired the committee, the Governance, Ethics, Risk, and Finance Committee of the Global Partnership for Education and was a member of the board of directors and the coordinating committee. He completed his graduate studies in France, uh, was sanctioned by the diploma, with the Diploma of Graduate Studies on Commercial, Administrative and Financial Issues from the Rouen uh, Business School and the Accounting uh, Expertise Diploma from France. Welcome. And good morning, thank you. Madam Moderator, first of all, first of all, I would like to thank the World Bank and the Korean Minister in charge of uh, Strategy and Finances for having invited us to this very important meeting. I would like also to thank the my predecessors, uh, Ken Nils, uh, Jean-Claude Monet, and others for the quality of their speeches and presentations, and I'm quite happy to be here, along with my uh, colleagues uh, on this stage. I will try and deal with the uh, question, which is uh, the strategic importance of the knowledge sharing for development, and I will try and talk about a few points. The first one, what environment, political and institutional environment, what is it? The second point would be the uh, knowledge sharing in the conception and the definition of public policies in the review and evaluation also, and what instruments uh, might we put in place? I think that since we are at the government level that is in charge of all development uh, sectors for a country. First of all, I think that this is the first step for the knowledge sharing. We have to know what is the institutional and political environment. This is a prerequisite. In a uh, democratic state, in a democratic regime where the government of the is chosen by the electors, this is a framework that is very propitious for a knowledge sharing in a country. So in order to be competitive, to uh, have the affairs of the state in hand, you have to share programs, ideas on all the development sector. This is a prerequisite. We have to ha be in a political environment, in an institutional environment that will be democratic, that will enable the comparing or the confrontation of the programs. The second item, uh, still in a democratic regime, in such a regime, you have spaces. 
spaces for a democratic debate. So the per excellence debate, democratic debate, will be the parliament. Thus, democracy, the parliamentary debate, the democratic debate, is a space for me that is knowledge sharing, experience sharing, and confrontation of points of view or comparing points of view. The third item, when the media is free, media that should be free, that will enable citizens to challenge the policy proposed by the government, the government will answer its citizens. There, I think that this is framework that is propitious to knowledge sharing. Another institutional item in the knowledge sharing in countries like mine, which do conform themselves to sub-regional and regional organizations. Senegal is member of the Economic and Financial Organization of African Union also. All these organizations that are sub-regional, regional are also a framework for sharing knowledge in this environment. Second item, how will we how will this knowledge sharing be implemented in the definition, the conception itself of public policies? Let me quote one example, a national example, which is on all sectors of activity, and another example that will be linked to the Ministry of uh, National Education, of which I am the head. Nationally, we had the uh, president who thought that we should have a plan that would include all and be a consensus for the development of our country, which was the Plan Senegal Emergent, which objective was to lead Senegal to emergence by 2035. Even though we supported ourselves on the international cabinet for the strategy, the process itself for developing such plan was a participative and inclusive process where the members of the government were questioned. The technicians in the administration were also inter questioned. Experts were uh, queried, international organizations were queried, unions, and so on and so forth, were queried, and all the professional organizations were queried on such. That lasted a whole year, which enabled us to have a plan that goes beyond the political differences and brings ambitions for Senegal by 2035, for my country, Senegal. Thus, uh, inclusive participation in the definition of the national policy. Concretely, in my domain, the Ministry of uh, National Education, our system we have invested a lot of resources in our education system, but these resources did not enable us to get the results that we wanted. So the president thought of the country, thought that we should organize the uh, meeting of the education and training. How did we organize such conference? The main organizing was given to the president of the University of Dakar, and we had regional platforms in all 14 regions that we have in Senegal, where all religious leaders, uh, professors, uh, parents, students themselves did come for a diagnostic of the system and give answers or solutions. So these were 14 regional platforms. We had seven topical commissions where we had experts on each topic, governance, financing, introduction of national languages in the education, in the national education system. And then we also had focus groups with the students, with artists, so on and so forth. This whole process lasted a whole year and was punctuated with three days of general meetings, plenary meetings, where all reports were presented. 
And these three days uh, did give a full report once this report was published, which was the report on the conference of the training and uh, education, was brought to the government. And that was a vision that uh, society in Senegal did have of its own, its own education system. The president looked at this program for a few months, studied it, and then we had a presidential Council on the conclusions of this conference on education and training. Within this council, we had all the members of the government, the whole of the union, professor union, teachers unions, the parents, the students, the partners, the technical partners, the financial partners, the whole society presented their views to the president and 11 conclusions were drawn, the 11 decisions by the president on the education which are today the main lines of the implementation of our education policy in my country. So this was the strategic level. Now, on the operational level, I think that with the Ministry of Education, each time that we had changes, at the beginning I did complain with my services because I saw that there were a lot of workshops, seminars uh, on different topics. But I see that these uh, seminars did enable in the implementation of all decisions that were made to share all knowledge again. And another item which might be an opportunity, that's what we saw in the uh, presentation by Mr. Monet with the technologies for communication and information we do have an opportunity for a mass production of knowledge to disseminate it also instantaneously. The other item being is to have pertinent knowledge, not to be submerged by knowledge at, to the point where you can't make a decision, but to have pertinent information and knowledge in order to make the right decisions. Madam moderator, this is my vision that I wanted to share. Thank you. But thank you very much to uh, all of you. I think we've got some great themes here. I, th I detect some really common um, themes. Firstly, uh, a, a real impatience to see faster results, to get more efficient knowledge transfer, to avoid duplication, um, mistakes, uh, lessons, pick up lessons. And I think uh, thirdly, uh, knowledge sharing is a way of basically opening up access to information and freeing up knowledge flows within countries, within sectors, and across countries. Um, so I think these are all great themes. I'm not sure if we have, hopefully we have time for one or two questions. Yes, okay, we do. We've got permission to run over time. So if anyone would like to kick off with uh, a question for the panel. Okay, I'm going to ask a question. <laughs> I'm really interested in um, uh, this uh, issue of how we transfer experience from the private sector to the public sector. And I'm, I'm interested in any of you have uh, a takeaway from Jean-Claude's presentation that you think would be useful and relevant for your context of working in government. Well, I, I think Mr. Monet said the right things. Uh, for me, uh, like I said, it was a culture shock when I got in there uh, to, the, to the ministry. And um, one of the things I chose to do was to bring up a, a set of consultants to look into the entire structure of the ministry. And the whole idea is to try to change the culture. And he did talk about culture. Uh, where people think operate, they're too territorial. I don't think there is any way we can uh, move. You know, we can we can share knowledge, and uh, the work that the consultants are doing for us is to uh, really transform the ministry, which is supposed to be essentially a technical ministry, uh, where technical information should be shared, and it's not being done. The Dams and irrigation department, dams department is not talking with the irrigation department, is not talking with the water supply department, and sometimes they have common projects, 
but they're all doing their own thing. Uh, so we, that's number one. That's the first thing we're doing, um, changing the, 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 the culture. And he did mention that it's very, very important that the, 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 we, we borrow a leaf from the, from the private sector, from the corporate world, so that the, the public service should begin to work uh, in the same manner with, no, with, with a lot of uh, 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 commitment uh, like, like the corporate world does. I think they don't do it because it's not a profit-oriented uh, uh, organization, the public service, but it is important because there is service delivery uh, 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 agency. So that is one thing that I, I think I, I quite agree with from his, uh, from his uh, contribution. Yes, uh, the Council of Governors in, in Kenya works very closely with the private sector. Uh, some of the innovations that we're implementing in agriculture, in health, are actually innovations from the private sector. Most of the counties are actually um, working out uh, investment uh, uh, projects that are collaborations between the county governments and the private sector. So we have PPPs that are being implemented uh, together with the investments that are being implemented together uh, between the, the private sector and, um, and the county governments. We also have uh, forums, investment forums that we, we do that are meant to attract investors uh, from um, the private sector that are also collaborative engagements between county and governments and, um, and, and, and the private sector. The biggest challenge we have, of course, is creating uh, platforms that to enable information sharing will be seamless and very effective um, between the county governments themselves and also between the county governments and, um, and the private uh, sector. And uh, indeed, as uh, the keynote speaker uh, pointed out when he was uh, speaking, attitudes and culture are a uh, um, big impediment to, 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 to creating these platforms and uh, innovating. And uh, we are also grappling with them, even as uh, everybody also grapples with them. Thank you. Uh, uh you called it a cultural shock, but um, I think I had the same thing uh, in, in, in our ministry. But um, the, the whole uh, nature of the public service um, with, uh, I think, the great examples from the private sector could make it better for education. The one thing is that uh, when not only the change of the management, uh, but this change of the management and the opening doors for private sector to the education actually helps us, my country, a lot in uh, investing more funding to the sector within uh, one year and a half for the simple reason that uh, we look differently at the education sector, not only because traditionally it's a very uh, only state budgeted sector. Uh, we didn't uh, let the private sector, uh, we, we used to close the doors for the private sector in the education, starting from kindergartens up to universities. And right now when we understood that A, after sharing the information and making it public, B, changing the management of the ministry on different levels, we realized that with, uh, without private help, uh, we wouldn't be able to make the change and keep up with all the challenges. And actually, uh, opening the gates for the private sector helped us uh, to increase the quality and to create new benchmarks for the education. And I think in this sense, uh, we should definitely be uh, within the keeping the best of the public sector, but also making it open for the private one. Thank you. I think that indeed, indeed, lessons drawn, as well as the approach, which was prescribed here by Mr. Monet regarding uh, private companies such as Microsoft, we can see examples of this uh, at the level of governmental management. There is one aspect here that uh, was striking in his uh, speech, the need to have a culture, uh, some of values, as it were. 
in where the organization itself recognizes itself. I mentioned the example of uh, the creation of the uh, Senegalese uh, plan. The fact that the uh, creation process was itself inclusive at the very outset means that the population becomes the very guardian of the implementation of said plan. And so the government is involved there in implementation. The three strategic objectives which were set out in this plan had to be espoused, had to be owned by the population. And this is what created the uh, citizenship that occurred around the development objectives that were the countries. Something that I learned also, thanks to the private sector, and that is also important with respect to our structures, is that administration and governments in general, or ministry levels, we work in our countries without, have, have with, without having any procedure manuals. And every time we had a procedure manual created, well, it increased the performance of the organizations because these tools are information tools. They are training tools as well, and they are also oversight tools. So training tools for new people who have just been recruited, they can use these manuals. They are information tools because if you carry out the task of somebody else, you know that the person who worked before you carried out task number one, and these are the constraints that that person under, well, experienced. And so for the person who's in, in charge of task two, he will actually look at what the person in charge of task one did. And all of this is incorporated in the procedure manual, which is very helpful for public organizations. This is something that we lacked in our cultures. Another important element here, and I spoke earlier about what we did specifically in the area of education in policy making. Well, every time, well, we basically have annual reviews of the education policy at the regional level, first and foremost. So we have the geographical reviews. And after that, we have a review as to the objectives that we have set out at the beginning of the year to know whether these objectives have been reached or not, and if they have not, why they haven't been. So these reviews incorporate all the various communities that participated in policy creation. So there are uh, parent-teacher meetings, reviews with technical and financial partners, thematic reviews. And then after all of this, we have a general review to find out whether the objectives have been reached, which have been reached, which haven't, and why they haven't been reached. So. In my eyes, these types of platforms make it possible to have a political dialogue amongst the various stakeholders with respect to public policies in our different countries. Thank you. Of you. I think um, there are lots of lessons that we can pick up for knowledge sharing uh, from the private sector. The goals of the public sector may be different, um, but I think the approaches uh, are directly uh, applicable, and I think you're all obviously uh, uh, seeing these opportunities. I think, I, think, I think for me, one of the big takeaways from the private sector lesson, which is true for us as individuals, it's true for us as parts of organizations, including here at the World Bank, uh, and it's true for countries as a whole, uh, that we are all both suppliers of knowledge and experience, and we're all learners. Um, and I think uh, this, this whole cultural uh, question of how you build collaboration to get knowledge sharing uh, across borders uh, is particularly important. I think for countries, because we're in the business of helping countries to develop, it's very important that we understand uh, what, 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 country, what models countries want to follow. Who do they see as their role models? Uh, it may be their neighbors, it may be their competitors, um, but it's important that we understand who they want to follow and, and what is their development path. Um, but also, I think it's also important to open up new opportunities uh, for knowledge sharing where we might not have known. And I think the, the example uh, of sanitation um, and, and, uh, uh, is, is a good example that we might find uh, lessons uh, where we didn't expect to find them or we didn't not know that they were. So I think, um, you know, I work in South Asia and I think it's a really important it's a region with very big countries, so there's a lot of knowledge and experience 
within the region um, that, it, that, that can be shared. But it's also important to open up the knowledge flows. How, how can South Asia become the next East Asia? Um, and so I think, I think it is very important to actually see this. And I think, I think the last point which I wanted to, to build on um, was really the point about the regional integration um, and the opportunities that come from knowledge sharing to actually build stronger partnerships, uh, stronger relationships to build regional integration. And I think where countries maybe have a history of political difference, knowledge sharing, can, knowledge management and knowledge sharing can actually be a vehicle for building trust and deeper integration and cooperation. So with that, I want to thank all of the uh, panelists. You bring a, a great deal of wisdom and rich experience uh, from your respective uh, countries and, and indeed por important portfolios. And you're clearly all leaders in knowledge uh, sharing and knowledge uh, uh, management uh, within your own context. So thank you very much. I appreciate you sharing your experiences with us today. Thank you once again, our distinguished honorable panel. We are now going to transition to our next item on our agenda, which is titled The Knowledge Cafe. As we came in this morning, we found sheets on our little pieces of paper like this on our seats. This is the time we'll be using them. So I'll kindly ask you to find the one you may have found as you came in. And my colleague, Kristen Tebby, will be taking us through the instructions of how this activity will happen. And in case you do not have one, please let us know and we will avail one to you at this point in time. So Kristen, if you could kindly come up and, and give us the instructions. Good morning. Hello, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome yet again. My name is Kirsten. I'm going to be leading you through this next session. Don't go anywhere yet. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> so in just a moment, we are going to get up and move down the hall to the atrium, which is where our Knowledge Cafe, our next session, our interactive session, will take place. The atrium is the open space just across from the main entrance of this building. We will all get up in just a moment and walk together there, okay? But as Twitty pointed out, I want to show you what to do with these cards. So hopefully you still have them. Hopefully you found one on your seat. If not, do not worry, do not be afraid. Everything will be fine. Um, what this is, is your table assignment. So we are going to move, as I said, into the atrium space in just a second. Everyone is going to be organized into eight pillars. I will explain all of this. Eight pillars of what we here at the World Bank refer to as our knowledge sharing capacity framework. Okay? So what you will see on your card, the text on your card, is the name of your pillar. The number on your card is the number of the table that you should find and sit at, okay? So just to get in a second, again, we're going to walk down the hall to the atrium. You will see the pillar. They're all marked with distinguishing signs and colors. And you will find also your table, which is again, the number on your card, okay? There will also be coffee stations next to your tables in the atrium. So we will all move together. You'll take your belongings with you We'll find a coffee and we'll settle down at our tables and then we'll get started with our interactive session. Okay, so let's go ahead and move again down the hall to the atrium. See you there.